Today's video is brought to you by Audible. Audible provides a great value way to access audiobooks for its members and is one of the best ways to make huge savings on Warhammer audiobooks, which is why I personally use and recommend it. As an Audible member, you will get one credit every month for any title across their entire premium selection. My choice this month is a shorter story at only one hour runtime, but it's directly relevant to today's topic. And I usually personally recommend people consider purchasing shorter audiobooks as to not waste the full value of an Audible credit, which is best spent on the longer nine hour plus premium audiobooks. Even if purchased though, premium members get a 30% discount on purchasing audiobooks, so it's still good value. You can start listening today with a free 30 day Audible trial where you'll get full access to thousands of audiobooks, originals and podcasts included in the Plus catalog. Just see below for my link and visit audible.com slash Lutin or text Lutin to 500 500 for those in the US. Full details about today's selection follow at the end of this video. Now, today is a mixed bag. Essentially, the first three chapters of this video are me discussing the evolving nature of how 40k lore is delivered, my various concerns therein, and the latter three chapters are me talking about the Inari and the Eldar. So there you go, you're welcome. Now, soon enough in a separate video, we'll also get to discussing the progressing end times for humanity in the Imperium to consider where things stand in the late period of M41, the time just before and after Primarch Gilliman returned to the Imperium which is essentially discussing the Dark Imperium series I was recommending at the end of last year. Before we get to that soon, as in imminently, the new Eldar Codex will be dropping, and it's looking to be apparently a chunky book. Most people I've spoken to this week, painters, gamers and lore fanatics, are quite hyped about this new Eldar Codex. But why? Well, for one reason, it's been quite some time now since the last Eldar Codex, roughly four years. And this has been made only more tantalizing by the fact that it's been shown that this book is thick. Is that a good thing though? Well, maybe. It's likely due to several things that I'm actually hoping for. One that would make sense is in combining the usually split Eldar faction books into one, as in Craftworld Harlequin, presumably we might see rules for the Corsairs by the recent showcase of those, and then the mixed faction of the Inari. The reason I speculate we will be seeing a combined codex is precisely because of the Inari. It would make sense to put things like the more niche Harlequin into the codex of the Eldar overall, because they generally have minimal units and could previously be included as part of this faction within the Eldar known as the Inari. Drakari, that's a different thing entirely, but just as they did in 8th edition, it seems very probable that there would be guidelines on how you could bridge that gap and include Drakari of course as part of your Inari force, but you'd likely need a Drakari codex. But we'll see soon enough, who knows. Now I'm of course not here to speculate about rules, if the law and rules went hand in hand you wouldn't for example see Ivrain, leader of the Inari, a figure who literally wields a sword made from the bones of an Eldar god and turn any who it touches into ashen instant death. If rules followed the law, this weapon wouldn't in its various iterations have been about as powerful as slapping someone in the face with a wet lettuce. That is a plus one strength, minus two AP, D3 damage. Ridiculous when you consider it's made from the bones of a god. Anyway, my frustrations that things like this and vortex grenades still do not make themselves felt in 40k aside, in all seriousness, you can't have the tabletop rules and lore be literally representative, otherwise Eldar would be going around shooting focused black holes at everybody, but sometimes it sure would be nice to lean into the madness a little. There is also another prospective positive in this fat looking Eldar Codex. It could signal a shift towards something so many of my tabletop counterparts have become ever more frustrated at, the let's call it scattering of rules between books. Now this blends into a wider discussion about releasing factional codex books and supplements, but as we're on the topic and while I am far from the most active tabletop player, I'm basically 70% lore, 25% painting and 5% playing, but I certainly like to pay attention. 
to releases related to tabletop, and I try to stay abreast of rule and point updates, even if it's just on paper for me, because I find that enjoyable. And most of the forces I own are calculated, even if they don't see a ton of use in the past couple of years. And like many others have said, I firmly agree that rules for any faction should singularly be combined into its codex. Supplements should come second to flesh out lore, provide campaign material, specific rules for those campaigns, that would be fine. But anything else, it just gets very clunky then for rules of factions to be split across multiple books. It's confusing and supplementary books should be just that, non-essential for your core function, simply there to enhance the gameplay enjoyment. Now with all that said of course, from a lore point of view, who cares, the more books the better, the more fragments of lore to find. But maybe this Eldar Codex might redress the balance here to a small degree, although in all honesty, I wouldn't put money on it. What I am really interested in though with this new Codex is very simply the Inari lore. I recently revisited the Inari lore, I raked over its ashen coals, I discovered that there was still very much some fire beneath, in fact more than a fire, it actually reignited my interest in the Inari, enough so that I could finally decide even on the direction I want to start painting my Eldar force that's been sitting either boxed or in a state of partial completion for the past six or so years and many far longer. So when this new codex drops I'm going to smash out an Inari force to showcase for you all, similarly to how I did with the Indomitus box set, I might stream a little bit of that, overview the new stuff and get the force painted. If I can binge it I should be able to crack through it pretty fast. More importantly though, I want that delicious lore of the Inari, I want to carve it up while it's still alive and screaming, as if it were in the depths of Kimura. That is of course, unless my worst irrational fears should come to pass. Now what I've feared the most for some time now was a major, not the first R word, but the second, restructuring of events surrounding what is known as the Gathering Storm. I wasn't at all concerned for such a thing until the recent Dark Imperium, restructuring, clarifying, call it whatever you will, but not that. What is the Gathering Storm? I hear you cry people who joined 40k over the past few years. It's a fair question, although given its importance it really shouldn't have to be a question at all. Gathering Storm was a trilogy of supplement books which contained, I always thought, a considerably solid lore primer for what was the 8th edition of 40k, but even beyond that. It set up characters like Belisarius Kor, The Return of Gilliman, it featured Sororitas, Saint Celestine, Inquisitor Greyfax, you got Cypher in there, and then of course we have The Rise of Ivrain, the Visarch and the Inari. It deals with some pretty heavy events, and unusually for supplement books, the lore was pretty substantial. What was very weird, but very Games Workshop, was that after those books came out, they stayed available for I guess an average reasonable amount of time, but were then just discontinued and everything went kinda dead. They just disappeared. Gathering Storm was only available for that short time, and since then they were only available digitally here and there, and I believe you can access them with Warhammer Plus, I think? But this to me was very very strange, because the Gathering Storm represented a major move forward in the narratives of several factions within 40k. This was also somewhat followed up on with the Psychic Awakening series, although these were too short, often contradictory, they didn't seem to be liked too well. Overall, the Imperium got far more out of the Gathering Storm than the Eldar, and what I mean by that is that since this time the Imperium has pushed forward significantly with the Dark Imperium novels, Nihilus Vigilus, we have Octarius breaking out, and now it's Nachmund Vigilus. This is also not to mention the at least 18 or so specifically related books that have come out since. The majority of these have been focused nearly entirely on the Imperium, to which I found that to be incredibly frustrating. On the Eldar side of things after the Gathering Storm, it just fell kind of flat, which is troubling. I seem to recall legendary Eldar author Gav Thorpe saying somewhere that the Eldar novels after Gathering Storm just didn't do so well. Now I know that's contradictory of me because I always tell you guys don't make statements if you can't point to specifically where you reference it from. Ha, just kidding, it's right here. This though for me, as Gav Thorpe stated, it's disappointing because the resurrection of Gilliman, the emergence of Balasarius Core, the Primaris, all this stuff is critically important in the expanding verse of 40k. But the actual story of what happened in that time became kind of lost, I really felt that, and was only followed up with abridged versions of things, in codexes and so forth. Plus, I know 40k is seen generally through the eyes of the Imperium, but you know what? The Eldar are also an important element of the evolving 40k verse, and I wish there was a better reason for it than Space Marine lore goes brrr, 
but that's basically what it is. And it's why I had wanted to recommend today Gav Thorpe's excellent Rise of the Inari novels as audiobook recommendations, only to discover to my horror and disgust that Black Library never seemed to have commissioned these as audiobooks, which is seethingly annoying. Anyway, I read them when they came out and I'll tell you they're bloody good. Not only do they expand and build upon the gathering storm, but they share curious details and point toward strange possibilities regarding the Eldar Necron relationship toward presumably the end of the war in heaven and possible allusions to the entire nature of the Eldar and their gods. So for some time I had been greatly concerned that perhaps because of the fact that the Rise of the Inari series had essentially been put on hold, and the fact that nothing at all had been updated or even expanded upon, apart from the bare bones details in the Psychic Awakening, Phoenix Rising, circa 2019, I started to get some significant irrational fear that the Inari were just going to become a thing that drifted off into the background, which would be a terrible thing. The one thing keeping me calm was the fact that the Inari have been pretty regularly referenced in other 40k material since, but somehow I couldn't shake this fear in the back of my mind that there was going to be some bizarre reset and the whole thing was going to be sidelined. So I was very relieved to see recently on a Warhammer community post previewing some of the brand new upcoming Eldar, the word Inari. Reassuring and exciting, and it's made me consider that maybe this new Eldar Codex could be, if not a step forward, then at least a solidifying keystone for the Inari, and at this point, I'll take that. So here's the thing, Gathering Storm was technically a supplement, as was Octarius recently, and so while my tabletop friends have I guess been steadily unhappy with how supplements have split rules for factions making the process of understanding just what you need to run a force a decent headache, in terms of the expanding narrative of 40k, which is of course what I'm primarily interested in, some of these supplementary campaign books are actually the best things going when it comes to the amount of lore contained, serving to flesh out often critical ongoing events. So not unlike Gathering Storm, these adjacent titles seem often to be one arm of how Games Workshop expands the evolving narrative of 40k, which when you think about it is actually pretty surprising. One of the most common comments I see here on the channel is people asking which audiobook or book do I need to catch up on what's happening in M41 right now. This is rarely how 40k works, and so it can be a variety of different things. It could be novels, it could be the supplement campaign books, it could even be games and other things, which I think is really surprising and also confusing for many people. I think as I've said before, for myself personally, things like the Necromunda and Titanicus supplements are must-haves, because from a lore perspective they contain so much detail that you just won't get it in novels. I think another thing that I've said before is that novels also tend to be more character-driven, not completely, just more character-driven, and thus contain a scattering of critical events dotted through them, which is fine of course, but it's supplements that drive the world-building of 40k, they tend to be the reverse of novels. They're light on characters, little if any conversation, but with steady narrative evolution of events. Not to mention, as we saw with Gathering Storm, a lot of people missed out on what turned out to be one of the most major pieces of background material. I'm amazed that even now there's people I know who are very into 40k and somehow just completely missed this. It's why I almost religiously ensure I get a copy of every supplement, because you never know what you're going to miss or might want to look at five years down the line. Because very often, tiny details included within a small side story are what become key. It's often not the kind of main blurb. It can be these little gems of narrative dotted through. Let's just take, for example, the tale of the gold and the stone men. You guys remember this when I was talking about STCs. Now, this story appears within a single page, small description known as the Journal of Keeper Cripius. This is forever lost within the tome of the third edition rulebook never seen again anywhere other than here, despite it being one of the most singularly epic, potentially revealing descriptions of the Dark Age of Technology, anywhere in the entirety of lore in 40k, which again is why I have physical copies of most of these things. The one aspect here I know can be somewhat unappealing is that most supplements of late have either been focused very much on the Imperium, which in 40k terms, let's be real, is neither unusual nor unexpected, but they also usually of course have a big chunk of tabletop stuff. 
which is great for some, but if you are only interested in the narrative, it can feel frustrating. Still, it is what it is. Most people who pick up supplements know what they're getting into, and that's why we have things more recently like Octarius. Not something that I'm unhappy about at all, because it's an epic slice of action in the 40k verse, and I wanted to know what was happening over there. But simultaneously, it feels very distracting when we have other major events occurring, like the Rift torn throughout the whole galaxy, and uncertainty around expanded details of Gilliman's crusade. What's going on? What's his relationship with the wider Imperium and the Ecclesiarchy? What's Call doing? Where will the Necrons fit into the picture? The list goes on and on and on. And Gathering Storm was an amazing step forward in the story of 40k, but funnily enough, not unlike so regularly in the current times, I actually remember people being really down on it when it came out. There was definitely an air of the hate train around the doom, gloom, everything sucks, why bother brigade doing the rounds. Yet funnily enough, when I described it in I think it was the Imperium's worst losses video, people seemingly loved it. But I think that initial unhappiness around the Gathering Storm was a combination of people soured at the concept of Cadia getting annihilated. That's a pretty hefty thing to kind of contend with. Biltan getting shattered, that's a tough one for people of the Elder. And then the strange alliance of factional elements to resurrect Gilliman. It was a lot for people to absorb when they had previously only drip drip drips of law progression in previous years, suddenly they're deluged with this massive explosion of change. And if there's one thing we know about humans, they don't like change. Gathering Storm set things up with a fascinating foundation of potential. It sowed a broad showering of lore seeds and shifted the previously rusted solid narrative of 40k as it had been for decades into a place where eventually those new stories could be harvested. And steadily we've seen that happening, but in terms of the major core narrative, it's still slowly slowly. Still, saying that, and without going into it yet again and raking it all over, within how I understand 40k to function as a verse both internally and externally, I have to be okay with any potential major changes. And this is fine, I can live with it, I can sleep at night, but very simply, I just don't want to see anything change regarding the Inari in regard to their status within the 40k verse as an established faction. The clarifications we got updated with Dark Imperium I feel were actually necessary to both allow 40k to remain at the end of M41 and also to allow a more expansive exploration of the Indomitus era, which I think Games Workshop realised was a mistake to just gloss over. It's my personal speculation this might slowly become Crusade slash Heresy 2, at least in terms of new unfolding narratives that steadily become some sprawling 40 plus novel series. I could list off as well all those tweaked details with Dark Imperium, but many of those are just housekeeping, and if it's really worth talking about, that's like the best saved for when I talk about Dark Imperium. So supplementary stuff like Vigilus may be the first steps in that direction, it's been happening for a while, but they also serve to knit things together. Essentially, the most important thing that changed was that previously the Indomitus Crusade had crossed the Great Rift and moved into Imperium Nihilus, but now it hasn't done that. The dangerous thing with making tweaks like this is that often it shifts other things, and it's why it can be really dangerous to make any timeline adjustments. It reminds me of that episode of Star Trek Voyager when they encounter the Krenum, and eventually we see a temporal space vessel commanded by the excellent Kurtwood Smith of fabled Robocop fame where he plays Clarence Bodica. In Voyager he plays Anorax who is obsessed with fixing the Krenum timeline to a restored state after unwittingly unleashing a plague and killing his wife. The point being, it's a very interesting example of how shifting one small thing in a timeline has broad consequences elsewhere, and this is why I restate my hatred of including time shifting anything when it comes to lore. 40k unfortunately is not exempt from this, and as I've said before, it's basically an established thing in the 40k verse, although thankfully instances of time travel or manipulation are extremely rare, and I truly fear for the day if it ever becomes more than that. If we ever start getting to different timelines or anything resembling the absolutely absurd state of Hollywood movie franchises, things you might see in like the Terminator series, or just take your pick of modern franchises. I'm done at that point. I'm not sure I would have the stomach to continue on because it's so absurd. I pray this never ever happens with 40k. It's also one reason 
why I truly fear movie adaptations of 40k and I'm not sure people have often really thought through clearly just how inconsistent and wildly varying in terms of quality movie franchises tend to be. Middle, 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 the tweaks mean that, for example, the story of Gilliman, Dark Imperium and so on occur before, say, the devastation of Baal. Also, I guess I'll note for those who are unaware, when the great rift of warp space tore the galaxy in half, it said this cast one side of the galaxy in darkness. Not literally, but people on that side of the great rift in the Imperium are unable to see the Astronomicon clearly. This is making communication and travel very difficult. And it's why the Quark series progressing the story of 40k is called Dark Imperium. And this side of Imperial territory is referred to as Imperium Nihilus. While the other side of the Imperium which is still able to use the Astronomicon and which enjoys more safety and stability is known as Imperium Sanctus. This is the side where we have terror and so on. I should probably discuss this more in a separate video. Anyway, in terms of the Gathering Storm, it seems so specifically interwoven at this point into how Gilliman came to being restored, I can't see how things would be altered, but things can happen. Despite it being so bizarrely inaccessible, Gathering Storm is one of the core if not most important events within the 40k verse. And I've always found it strange how Games Workshop don't just make a single standalone supplementary book that just focuses on bringing people up to speed with where things are. I suppose arguably that's what the rulebook is for, but the 40k rulebook is one hefty book and about two thirds of it is not lore. If you wanted to get into 40k just for say the stories and so forth, that's pretty frustrating to have to do. So yeah, Gathering Storm it's well worth revisiting if you can get hold of it, because every time I refresh my memory of the story of the Inari, it really does fire me up and inspires me to think about the expanding narrative of 40k in M41, which boils down to there is a lot left to tell. I recently had someone ask, hey, I thought all the Eldar had to die to defeat Slanesh. And it's true, this is what Crawford seers and their mythology have turned most Eldar toward believing for the longest time. That is, until the Inari came along. They believe there is the possibility that if they can release Inaird, they may not need all Eldar to die, which obviously seems preferable. As I've often said, Eldar souls seem different to human souls. They're more resilient and do not just dissipate in the warp. If we look at Drakari, there even seems to be a brief period when an Eldar dies its soul sort of hangs around before it's snatched away, I guess, by Slanesh. This is how Drakari, for example, regenerate. A homunculi can regenerate a Drakari warrior's body after death. Interesting enough, except what's more interesting is that a Drakari soul, i.e. an Eldar soul, seems to, like I say, hang around for as long as a day after death, and then can be reconnected with their body. Unfortunately for captured mortals, the Jakari's means of regeneration is usually through the suffering of others. This nourishment from suffering enables their detached soul and mind to, as we say, effectively become reconnected with a body that was often near fully destroyed. This also aligns with other things we know about the Eldar soul. The fact that, for example, it's spoken of in their mythology, and also we see in their use of wraith constructs, the ability to use their souls to pilot war machines. Perhaps more in the past than now, this ability for an Eldar to detach their soul for some purpose, maybe collectively, and then return to themselves is very much part of their culture. This is likely too dangerous now with Slanesh, of course, but in their ancient past, it may have been very different. This is, of course, partly my speculation, but it seems a logically reasonable connection, especially when we consider the fact that Eldar children are said to have a considerable gestation cycle and are very rare. People often wonder as to why this is. Well, when your race in the ancient times basically barely ever died, if you only ever had a certain number of souls to go around, this might have made sense. Still, that might not actually be how things worked. It's never been clearly described. So I often have wondered, did Eldar souls long ago wait around in some kind of strange purgatory until a new Eldar child was formed and then becomes a vessel for those souls to attach themselves to, being effectively reincarnated? 
Drakari seem to be able to create offspring either artificially or naturally, and they clearly have what we might consider to be a soul. So this aspect is not especially clear. I've never so far found really a satisfactory answer. And if you have, I guess, drop it down below. References rather than opinions, always appreciated. So when it comes to the Inari and the Crawford Eldar, this sense or belief that all Eldar have to die, what is the reasoning or ideology behind this? Well, simply they believe that once all Eldar die, there will be enough souls within their infinity circuits that they can then coalesce into one form and collectively be powerful enough to destroy Slanesh. This is in fact an ancient piece of Eldar lore. It goes all the way back to the first edition of 40k. Although you'd expect this to be in the main first 40k tome that you always hear about, Rogue Trader. In fact, the Eldar were barely mentioned here. Details about them and their culture was equally lacking. No mention of a webway or Eldar paths, no talk of spirit stones and the fall. Slanesh who? So you'd imagine it would be the next edition of 40k, the fabled second edition, when the Eldar got their first real codex and reams of specific details that things really were fleshed out there. Very, very weirdly, the first real outline of the Eldar came one year after Rogue Trader in the Codex Titanicus, which is incredibly odd, but fitting for first edition, I suppose, where everything is weird. So here we finally had the foundations of the Eldar, the four infinity circuits and so on. And critically to what we're talking about, yes, that's where there's a description of the so-called last hope for the Eldar. It's often amazing to me how little the law has changed from the very, very beginnings of 40k. There are some factions which have had things changed more dramatically, but by and large, a lot of stuff has stayed very, very consistent, even over like 30 years. Now in this old version, it describes something a little different from the more modern descriptions that all Eldar must die to destroy Slanesh. It talks of how they believe eventually all craft world will form one final infinity circuit and thus the collective spirits here will form a new power to merely subdue Slanesh. This is interesting because Eldred Ulthran actually has visions of this larger spirit matrix in the Gathering Storm. Even more interestingly, in this original description, it doesn't talk about Eldar souls destroying Slanesh to free themselves. It talks instead of the Eldar spirits from the Infinity Circuit merging with Slanesh to create a balanced entity. So if successful, it was the hope of the Eldar to then be recreated in a better form. Just how that would occur or how the Eldar returned to the material space seems an open question. Old or new, this ancient first edition version is part of the lore. It may still be relevant, and I'll speak to that later. After these early explorations of the Eldar, the second edition really then fleshed out the Eldar as we see them today. But within a small section of the third edition Eldar Codex was where we got our first small glimpse of what would not be really mentioned again until Gathering Storm. So within the third codex craftworld was the first description of Aeneid. It talks of how Eldrad Ulthran, legendary farseer of Ulthwe, he recalls how he opened his mind to the infinity circuit and listened to the Eldar essence. His mind passed beyond the single craftworld to those beyond and what he calls the eternal matrix. He pulled his mind even further that he might hear the whole voices of the Eldar race within the collected consciousness. This is where Eldrad hears a faint rhythm within the anarchic sound of a billion dead souls. Yet he could feel something else, a greater unconsciousness which lay behind the collective spirits of all the Eldar within their matrix. An entity, something dormant within. Of course though, Eldrad knew what this must be, the slumbering being that would be unleashed when all Eldar souls passed beyond and formed together. It was Eldrad who first doubted the mythology of the Eldar that they must then all die to defeat Slanesh. What if they were wrong? What if they were all to perish and instead Slanesh held the Eldar's souls in torment for all eternity? Well, what then? And so this ancient description was the first time when the being of Eldar prophecy was described as Aeneid, the last hope of the Eldar, god of the dead. Essentially, what was slowly becoming apparent to the Eldari is that as their souls become part of the infinity circuits, this god grows in power. Eldar seers conceptualized this process that when every Eldar had died, Aeneid would awaken and have the strength to defeat Slanesh forever. So this became known as the only hope for the Eldar's survival. But still, as Eldrad had pondered, this was a very uneasy prospect. It's fine to discuss it theoretically, but what if they were in fact wrong? 
It seemed quite an expensive theory to go all in on, get it wrong, and you lose it all. And so this is why Eldrad Ulthran began to diverge from the more establishment Eldar seers in his attempts to discover how to awaken Inead early. His first attempts by channeling the remains of Farseers through every infinity circuit were disrupted by Death Watch Astartes, although it were perhaps no bad thing as it would have damaged both the Astronomicon and caused damage across all Eldar craft worlds. However, Eldrad's quest proved why the Eldar are potentially so dangerous right now. For all their wisdom and power, they're not unlike a wounded, frightened creature backed into a corner. The stakes for the Eldar in M41 are incredibly high, and some of them, like Eldrad, feel they have literally nothing left to lose anymore. He intends to bring Ined into an awakened state, destroy Slanesh, and save his race. And he intends to do so by really any means necessary, and whatever the cost. And yes, it's true, they have been aiding the Imperium somewhat, and it seems like they're kind of working towards a greater goal. The Eldar tend to focus selfishly on things for themselves, and even when it appears like they are aiding others, it's usually for their own needs, ultimately. And this is where the Inari appear. Led by Ivrain, they seek to use the Crone Swords to rouse this god, but without having to sacrifice all Eldar, using a ritual known as the Seventh Path. Now, I would hope you may begin to appreciate why I have lately become so enraptured with the Inari, Ivrain, and their quest to unleash the Eldar God of Death, Inead. I mean, in itself, it just sounds epic to me. But I love this idea that until now, the Craftworld Eldar were just sort of tootling along, doing what they can to mitigate the horrors of chaos, following their paths, listening to seers, but overall just kind of wallowing in their miserable slow bleed into oblivion. The Drakari meanwhile happily maiming and committing horrors unimaginable to humankind, and being on the whole pretty okay with it all. Nonetheless, the Eldari overall were in this depressing state of a steady and slow downward spiral with no clear path forward. Then enter Ivrain and the Inari. I just find it incredibly captivating that this figure emerges, she brings champions to her cause, and when nobody wants to hear it, she shatters a craft world and unleashes a never before seen avatar of Aeneid, that immediately turn followers to her cause and leave many more questioning just what has occurred, and ever since, more and more disciples flock to the cause of the Inari, in their now seemingly impossible, but perhaps not, quest to locate the last crone sword and unleash Aeneid to destroy Slanesh and in so doing perhaps save her people from total oblivion. It's pretty awesome. Also, Ivrain herself is quite an insane character, which again I think has sometimes been lost along the way. Originally she was a craft world elder, Biltani, however she became known for what has been described as decisive violence, shifting one moment from well-mannered etiquette and polite societal conversation to slashing people's throats open as they collapse on their knees with a fountain of crimson ichor spilling through their hands. She's also said to have been a Corsair at one time, and finally she found herself among the Dark Eldar of Comora, performing as a gladiatrix in their massive orgies of displayed violence, which the Drakari used to infuse themselves with the power of suffering, replenish their spirits. Yvrain is both a lethal and changeably dark individual, certainly not one to be underestimated. In this time while she lived in Camorra, Yvrain would meet the Visarch, another true believer of Aeneid, and here was where she would become possessed while on the cusp of death, having fought viciously in an arena of violence regularly held by the Dark Eldar, Aeneid would speak to her and begin her path with the Inari. This was no chance occurrence though, it was in fact surprisingly Eldrad Ulthran who yet again had twisted the strands of fate in his efforts to enable Inead into being. Ivrain though it seems was chosen by forces unknown, she had died at the exact moment of the god's ascension, a moment of warp convergence so powerful it led to a hyperspatial quake known in Kimura as a disjunction. Spires toppled, districts turned in on themselves, statues fell apart, and amid the chaos, millions died. She would escape Kamora though, with the help of Corsairs, eventually to end up at the Beel Tarn craft world, where we see one of the key events of the Gathering Storm, and Ivrain unleashes the avatar of Inea, the Incarnate, by withdrawing one of the Crone Swords from the Infinity Circuit. We see the Incarnate emerge 
to the shock, awe, and horror of the Craftworld Eldar amid the fracturing of Craftworld Biltan. The more interesting aspect to this is that while the Inari and Eldrad have their belief as to what will happen ultimately, which they clearly believe to their core, in actuality no one truly knows just what might happen if they do indeed unite these crone swords. This to me makes the entire thing all the more tantalising. If Rain and Eldrad Orthran believe they're doing the right thing, but are they? Despite their visions and whispers, how can they know just what powers could be unleashed here? The gods of the ancient Eldari are far, far more powerful than the avatars that we see now sometimes walking battlefields of M41. The ancient Eldar gods? It's really unknown as to just what in fact they were. They're spoken of, we believe, often allegorically. Many believe the Eldar gods were simply figures in their folklore who are representative of either the Eldar's journey in steadily unlocking the knowledge of their technology, or perhaps these gods were initially the most ancient race of the Old Ones, and in the beginning, while they were aiding the early Eldar with guidance, to the Eldar they appeared godlike, which seems logically reasonable. But it's believed that this is when they were required or at least distracted with their ongoing war with the Necron tier, so they left the Eldar, and when they returned, they were perhaps not received in the same way. So it may have been that somewhere along the way, these Eldar gods became more mythical figures. It's also possible they were not sentient beings at all, but perhaps powerful technology now lost. This is all very speculative and barely more than opinion. But when you're talking about things in the time span of millions of years like you are with the Eldar, they themselves have almost no concrete knowledge of this time anymore. And so this makes the possibility of the Eldar in M41, that is to say the Inari, unleashing something that may very likely be beyond even their incomprehension, for very obvious reasons considerably troubling, but also very exciting. Is the galaxy of M41 ready to see the emergence of powers not seen since the war in heaven? I very much doubt it, but this is yet another reason why I feel the Inari are so appealing. The Eldari may be ready to set in motion events that tear the galaxy apart even more violently than the war in heaven or the birth of Slaanesh. It could lead to the destruction of the galaxy as it's known to humanity, or it could lead to the salvation and the elevation of the Eldar as the most powerful race in the galaxy once again all of which are not appealing to the Imperium of Man. These prophetic world-ending scenarios are one of the reasons as to why the Eldar have always stood out to me as potentially one of the most dangerous factions within 40k. On the face of it, they seem less troubling than others. Chaos tearing the galaxy apart, corrupting the Imperium, Tau with their exponential grip on technology, the Tyranid slowly devouring the galaxy, and the Necron resurrecting their vast empire. And then Orcs crumping everything in sight, I guess. Then you have the Eldar. They're often dismissed out of hand for appearing to be weak, their far slighter frame and highly elegant design of war machine, their appreciation for arts and culture that permeates everything they do even in combat. It all seems terribly out of place in the 41st millennium, not to mention of course their perceived pitiful numbers comparable to nearly all other factions. What threat can they pose to the Imperium of Mankind or the Destroyers of Chaos, the Undead Legions of the Necron tier or the Great Devourer? They're a dying race, they should surely be pitied. Except in actuality, no. You can sit back down again, Eldari loyalists. Because in reality, the Imperium by and large don't mess around with the Eldar too much. This is often assumed because, why bother? They're not worth it. I'm sure there are some Imperial naval captains who truly believe that. The more likely reason, for one, is that they're one of the few other races in the galaxy who mostly leave the Imperium alone. Craftworld Eldar, that is, of course, not necessarily Drakari or Corsairs. They may have crossed paths here and there, but they're not facing each other on a galactic war of extremes like the Tyranid, Chaos, and Necrom. Plus the fact that in numerous circumstances the Eldar have actually aided the Imperium, as I said earlier, quite significantly. Now Lord Commander of the Imperium, Gulliman, has returned, it would look even less likely that the Imperium will be looking to start many fights with the Eldari, as they were instrumental in assisting his resurrection. Gulliman has even held counsel with members of the Eldar to seek their advice in recent times, but on top of all of this remain the fact that the Eldar are not faction to be taken lightly. It is true that they are, by comparison to many others, smaller in number, and at a surface level they appear frail comparative to, say, hulking warriors of the Imperium. Yet they also have weapons which fire monomolecular discs that cut through ceramite armour, flesh and bone like paper. Similarly, their blades some so powerful that they should by all rights cause instant death to anything they touch, and more outlandish melee weapons so horrifying they rival the Tyranids. World-ending alien heavy weaponry, and all of this is nothing compared to their psychic mastery. 
their ability to just move faster than human vision, as well as manipulate the strands of fate by peering into the near future. The Eldar's ability to do so only further leans into some of my speculations about the nature of time in 40k. Yet all of this is really just window dressing. For myself, the Imperium tolerating the Eldar is in fact a catastrophic mistake albeit currently a necessary catch-22 or choose your contradictory phrasing of choice because while the Imperium of late has been very much needing the guidance and assistance of the Eldari, they are in fact very troublingly dangerous. Their motives and their indifference to destruction should not be forgotten because it's not so visible. It's easy to fear those who are devouring in biomass or scouring souls in the ways displayed by the other enemies of humanity. But the concerns about the Eldar are things like just what cards do they hold behind their back? They're very careful about allowing humans to not know too much about just what they have going on. For example, the Black Library. It's often been rumoured that one of the Eldar gods, the Laughing God, may still exist within the webway, their ancient nature within the galaxy, plus access to technology that if it were fully functioning and understood and harnessed properly, is spoken about as laying waste to enemies far more powerful and numerous than those now in M41. Worth remembering, the Necron, decided it were better to allow Entropy to take care of the Eldar for them than continue a straight fight. The Silent King saw firsthand how dangerous and powerful the old Eldar were at the end of the war in heaven and thought better of it. If they can defeat Slaanesh, they can regain more power than has ever been seen by the Imperium. Without the fear of Slaanesh, their mastery of psychic power will surely enable them to unite and rediscover so much of their ancient comprehension of warp technology. It seems reasonable to assume that once they themselves were restored, they could repair and maintain control of the webway once again, which enabled them tactical power that was once unrivaled. The Eldari of old were seemingly masters of all, and during their own golden age before the darkness of the warp, they had very little to worry about. They needed for nothing, and they feared nothing. This was of course part of their decadent downfall as their zenith gave way to boredom, and ultimately a depraved downward spiral into oblivion. On occasion discoveries have been made by the Imperium that suggest the ancient Eldar very likely had a truly terrifying understanding of psychic power. This is one of those more unknown pieces of 40k lore but it is established that the Eldar had developed the capability whereby they were able to simply think of a thing and it would be formed into existence, presumably from psychic warp matter, not unlike how demons are able to coalesce in real space. This could be anything they wished to manifest, a handheld weapon, a squad of infantry, a grav tank, a titan, a starship, and it was known as the reality engine. The Eldar had such power and mastery of the warp, they were effectively able to remake reality. During the fall, and not entirely dissimilarly to humanity, the Eldar presumably lost much of their most powerful tech. Although when I say tech, it's maybe better to say knowledge, as their technology is likely more to do with understanding how to manipulate and manifest energy from the warp. Although this is not explicitly described, I believe that it's a fair logical reasoning when we consider how the vast majority of Eldar civilization was completely annihilated in the birth of Slaanesh, and the fact that ever since they have been staying highly focused on their mental discipline, and not so much on rediscovering their ancient ways, although they do this sometimes. The shock and pain of the fall is still very real for the Eldar, and so the less they dabble in warp things that they're not entirely sure of, likely the better. For humanity, their forbidden fruit is technology. For the Eldar, it's the warp. So the power of such a thing is obviously terrifying to even consider. But of course, it's true that all races in the galaxy appear to have had terrifyingly insane weaponry. The Necron's Celestial Orrery, or the Imperium's ability to fire weapons that phase objects fractions of seconds back in time, so they create truly insane destructive levels of power as two objects try to occupy the same space and time. Now, lastly, as I always say, references, this Eldar imagination machine sounds pretty crazy, and it's the kind of thing I see people post, oh, the Eldars can just imagine stuff into being. Sounds kind of mad and one of those things that's just not true. If you don't believe me and want to read about this mad piece of ancient Eldar technology, you're looking for the story titled Fist of Demetrius. So what I'm trying to say is, the Eldar are more than they appear, and then we come to the Inari. The Inari, for me, at least in lore terms, are the most exciting aspect, see what I did there, of the Eldar in M41. They're chasing the ultimate Eldar goal, the destruction of Slaanesh, the restoration of their entire race. They're doing so with seemingly little regard for the present consequences, flying around the galaxy, leaving death in their wake. Or we might say that the followers of Aeneid bathe in death. 
They're even empowered by it. If Rain was able to seemingly by chance discover that perhaps through her encounter and vision with Aeneid, she had somehow absorbed the soul of others. Whereas the Eldar of the Craft Worlds are using spirit stones to protect and store souls, Drakari continually nourish their souls with the suffering and spirit of others, Yvrain realised that if she could teach her discovered skill to others, then the Inari would lie somewhere seemingly between the two. Importantly for her Drakari followers, the ability to absorb souls would relieve them of their need for continual nourishment, but it also meant by taking the soul of another into themselves, they would become a protective vessel and act as a living refuge from Slaanesh. The Eldar would no longer need spirit stones then, nor would their souls have to exist within the purgatory of the infinity circuits. This sits in line with what I've continually noted about Eldar souls and how they can be seemingly detached and reattached with living vessels, and this realisation that it could occur with a living individual animated Ivrain even more, and offered those following her and the cause of the Inari a rare glimmer of hope amid the many millennia of darkness. Still with all that said, as an Autark of Bieltan said, the Inari are a curse upon our fractured race, a mockery of our Eldari forebears. How can we return to those days, unite behind the false glamour of a lost supremacy? When the follies of that age were so profound, they scarred the universe. We have forged a path that leads away from damnation, tried and true. Those that would lead us back at the behest of a fanatic, a mutant, a demon, are so deluded they should be sent to embrace the macabre shadow god they serve. A bleak outlook, but certainly one also shared by the Imperium, where Inquisitor Greyfax observed upon meeting the Inari for the first time, you Eldar twist fate, and only ever in your own selfish interests. <music> Lastly, for us today, I want to follow up where this idea comes from in regard to the Inari following what they thought was a clear path to salvation, but in actuality may be unlocking powers far beyond their ability to comprehend. This is in part because, as I said, I'm very curious if we will get any further answers in this upcoming Eldar Codex, or if it will be left generic and for likely supplements or novels to expand upon. Knowing generally how Codexes tend to go on expanding lore, I lean toward the second option being more probable, but you never know. What if Rain came to realise, or at least what she believes she has come to understand, is that when Slaanesh was born, whatever the Eldar gods are or were became destroyed and scattered throughout the Eldari, pieces of their souls attached and connected again and again into mortal form, just as the souls of the Eldari themselves appeared to behave. She saw a piece of one of the gods Lileath in herself, and within Eldrad Ulthran, the seer god Morai Heg, the crone. If Rain's rationale makes some sense, it's why some seem to gravitate towards specific behaviour and ability within the Eldar. Yet Ivrain has now become torn and deeply troubled by this concept. Essentially, because she has gone from having a very clear quest, one, find swords, two, save entire Eldar race. Sorted. Now that's great, and it feels like something you can really easily sell to people who are looking for a way out of their endless despair spiral. But then suddenly, she has a vision, and comes to realise that shockingly it is far from that simple, and the whole thing is considerably more complex, and worse, the outcome is far from being certain, and it could mean any number of troubling conclusions. Somewhat of a harder sell, and it flags the concerns of the Craftworld Eldar. If Eldrad and Ivrain are wrong, what then? It's not an unreasonable question. Here's something to chew on though. Given Ivrain's vision and subsequent realisation that pieces of their Eldar gods were seemingly shattered or dissipated somehow and now lay dormant, attached within living Eldar, the infinity circuits and what Ivrain believed was Aeneid may mean what they perceive as Aeneid is in fact a combined entity of several of the Eldar gods. This is what Ivrain came to suspect, and it raises another troubling prospect. And for clarity, this is where we drift off into more of the speculative opinion. Because what if Slaanesh is in fact the fused remains of the pantheon of Eldari gods themselves? The coalesced power of what in the moment of creation for Slaanesh allowed it to fuse together their souls. It then continues to acquire more and more Eldar souls, and it may even explain as to why the Drakari suffer this soul leeching effect. And this somewhat makes sense in terms of what we understand about the Chaos Gods as well. But that's a sideways thing, and I think it goes off into the Dark Origins, which I want to get to. Now, there's no concrete basis to necessarily believe that that is the case. 
What I would say is, consider Moray Hag and Cain when we think of Slanesh and Aeneid. The Eldar and their gods always are believed to have some foundational principles within a cyclical existence, rebirth, life, death. As the crone god is believed to have said, according to their ancient mythology, only a god can harm another god. This is how the crone swords are created. If Aeneid is a fusion of the Eldar gods, one of them being the crone, this may explain why the swords sought by Evrain would manifest the being known as Aeneid. So not a new or single Eldar god, but several fused together to battle and destroy whatever Slanesh actually is, or perhaps something else. Ivrain is not entirely certain just what the outcome would be, and this is where I want you to recall the descriptions of the first edition that I said I would talk about later, where it discusses about merging of the coalesced Infinity Circuit souls with Slanesh to create some balanced entity, not to destroy it. If Slanesh were some fused being forged from the broken Eldar gods, this balancing might even make sense and allow even the lore of the Eldar to come full circle. Again, wild speculations, but it is something interesting to think about. The narrative of the Inari is said to have been mothballed, essentially, by GW, because the rise of the Inari novels didn't do so well. This is a terrible mistake. It's one of the most exciting, refreshing, and captivating narratives within the 40k verse, and it deserves to be pushed forward. I don't have a large hope that we're going to see this happen in a simple codex release, but if the Inari are further embedded within the new Eldar Codex, plus if they do what many people suspect and build these factions into the new codex, this to me is a step in the right direction. It would mean that the plight of the Eldar and the Inari are not dead and buried, but enshrined with the lore, and more importantly, it means it far less likely to be revised, but will at some point be instead expanded. I greatly await that time, for it's probably one of the stories I find myself most hyped, captivated, and invested in. The Eldari story is fascinating, and I always want to hear more. I'll be back soon with more on this. I probably want to have a little revisit when the Eldar Codex does come out and just discuss some of the things there. And like I said, I want to crack on and smash through this Inari force that I've suddenly felt very hyped to put together. But as always, appreciate you guys. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, drop a like. And as always, back soon with much more. So now let's talk about my next selection for Audible. Today's recommendation is actually several because I wanted to give a good couple of options related to the Gathering Storm and to the Inari, and then something which gives some good depth for the Eldar. First up, Hand of Darkness and Eye of Night. These are two short audiobook dramas released near to The Gathering Storm, both run really basically at an hour long, and personally to get the best value from Audible, like I said, always recommend to purchase these at a reduced rate for premium members. You can always use a credit if you wish. But despite their short length of only at an hour, they give a lot of depth for what they are. I also disagree with some of the reviews made by others that say they finish abruptly, don't give enough. These are short stories essentially, and it's important to understand that a short work like this is never going to be able to wrap up some massive story in a short period of time. It's almost inevitable that they will come to a stopping point with a somewhat open end and be a briefer investigation of a verse. It's basically a snapshot look. Hand of Darkness focuses on Ivrain and the characters in this short story really come strongly through. I think honestly it's amazing the depth that we do get from such a short audio drama, but this one really pulled me in. Then you've got Eye of Night, which is not as strong as Hand of Darkness for sure, but it's it's worth a listen for a small, like I say, snapshot into the characters of Inquisitors and also just to hear Greyfax screaming, terminate them all. Now understandably, shorts are not something everybody enjoys. I always have, so it's probably why I feel quite happy to recommend them. But if you want something more this month, a bit more meat to it, I would recommend Jane Czar, The Storm of Silence. This is a nine hour audiobook, so I'd suggest well worth a credit here. And it deals, of course, with one of the most enigmatic Phoenix Lords of the Eldar. Now this story itself, I think, is middle of the road. But what's great about this audiobook is the cross-section you get of the Eldar, their history and general 
culture and for that reason I think it's well worth a listen. So those are my selections for this month and remember if you're new to audiobooks you can start listening today with a free 30-day audible trial and get full access to thousands of audiobooks, originals and podcasts included in the Plus catalogue. Visit audible.com slash Lutin or text Lutin to 500 500 for those in the US. Thanks as always for your support and I'll see you all in the next one.